Today's speaker is uh, uh, Bob McCarthy, and he's brought all his groupies today. Um, the, um, uh, the, the ultimate compliment on the, on the legal side when you practice law uh, at this age is when you have a worthy adversary and go tooth and nail on cases, and then you become allies afterwards. And I met, am I blocking you? Good. I met Bob. Um, <laughs> Good, thank you. Well, you're paying attention. First row, okay, you get to go first afterwards. Uh, I, I met Bob on a number of cases uh, over the years, and uh, some would say on the litigation side that they would characterize me as somewhat aggressive. No. Uh, no. no. And somewhat, somewhat abrasive and, and rather direct um, when, you're, when you're an advocate in a courtroom setting. What it really is, is it's the substitution for combat with guns and weapons. Uh, Bob made me look like a minor leaguer uh, in, in terms of stuff. I think his famous line is, in Montgomery County, you could have the judge sign an order giving you a potted plant. <laughs> well, something like that. Uh, Sunday I dis dinner menu. A, a Sunday dinner menu. I discovered in Montgomery County and, and the environment thereof, um, you got to go through him one way or another. Um, he, is, he is just an excellent... Uh, attorney and what was, what I found, um, uh, uh, what I find endearing about him is that he gets to a bottom line real fast. Um, he he understands what's going on in a case and in a guardianship matter. For those of you in that field and for some of you may not be, when you go contested, uh, my good friend Gene Robinson is here from from Virginia, who's moving into that field. The fees escalate through the roof. And I, I recently had a case between uh, the second wife and the first children fighting over daddy and his placement. Uh, the legal fees ran a quarter of a million dollars. And um, when we went to the judge to ask the judge to award fees, they looked at us both and said, I'm not going to take it out of his estate between the children and the wife. Let them each pay their own fees and get out of my courtroom. What one of our responsibilities is, is to try and solve cases early. And uh, this guy is excellent at doing that. He sees, it, he sees it right through at the beginning and tries to come to a quick resolution. Not always what you want him to do, um, but he gets it done. And, and the second piece that I wanted to do this today, second reason is, uh, and I didn't, I didn't prepare you for this, but you can talk about this, I'm sure. The, the single hardest thing I find, the challenge that we have, is that, that the, it's the moving target of capacity. And I think we've had some sessions on that in the past. But what tends to happen with the law uh, is that the law usually is 10, 15, 20 years behind in terms of what's happening out on the street. And we're all dealing with capacity issues. Many, many people in the room are dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's and all of those issues. Frontal lobe dementia, we've had those topics. And there are different areas of capacity. As a matter of fact, we've had the case. Um, are you going to talk about that case today? OK, he doesn't know. Um, where, where we have a, a mother who has capacity to say she wants to live with this child, but no executive ability to understand what that means. So you have articulate capacity, but you don't have executive capacity. You may have financial capacity, but not planning capacity. The courts have not expanded yet to be able to divide that up. They just have one standard. What our job is, and his job primarily, is, is to figure out when you're appointed guardian ad litem or representing, as he did in that case, is if the woman's wishes have to be honored or you've got to subjugate them to the necessities of, of real life. With that, um, Bob McCarthy and Gabriella. Gabriella, who is, you'll introduce them. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> Bob and I have, have done a lot of this case, and like I said, it is the ultimate compliment to be invited here to, to talk after some of the hammer and tong things have been going through. To return the compliment, uh, for most of my D.C. guardianships now, after dealing with Bob, they go to Bob because the D.C. courts are peculiar to say the least also, and um, he just handles it more efficiently down th there. In uh, Maryland, particularly Montgomery County, although I work in all the counties in the, in the state, uh, I handle a lot of these cases. Um, the first case is why are you here and why do you care, and why, do you, why you're here and why you care is to make money. Uh, I will go through uh, a lot of these different things that I get involved in. Um, 
I am a court-appointed guardian. I've done it about 500 times. I'm currently the guardian for about 100 different people right now. And I have an extremely small staff because I hire you all to do the things that need to be done. So at the end of the day, you're going to discover, hey, baby Bob McCarthy can make me some money if I hire his services. More likely, and what I'd like you to get out of this whole thing, is to go in that magic picture talking box called the computer, the interweb, plug in Montgomery, uh, plug in attorneys, guardianship, Maryland, and you're going to call those attorneys and say, I just know everything there is to know about guardianship because of Bob McCarthy, and here's the services I can provide to you. I'll also give you some gatekeepers. There's a trick to this place. There's gatekeepers out there who make decisions. Because every one of you provides services, there's a whole bunch of lawyers in the world. There's also a whole bunch of you guys in the world also. I don't particularly care who I use as long as they provide me reliable services. So if one of these gatekeepers say, I prefer Fred instead of Susie, I'm going to use Fred because it makes my life easier. So that's why you're here is to make money. What is guardianship? Parent patriae. Uh, parent patriae is father of the country. Our, our laws, the United States came from England. The, the, the father of the nation was the king. When we set up this country, we transferred all the laws over here. So the government is the father of all disabled people. That's the authority they go by. We've also talked about disabilities. The disabilities you have are, most of my cases are dementia cases, crazy old people cases. Then there is um, people who are younger who are mentally ill, bipolar people, uh, early stroke, early onset dementia. And the other thing is children. Uh, children on the age of 18 who are orphans or otherwise need, uh, need to be protected. Um, there are a lot of alternatives to guardianships. Uh, let, let me start with that. Maybe if I can pose on you two to take half the room here and hand out the stacks of them. I made 50 copies. If there are, you don't get a copy, call, I'll give you a business card. You can call my office and I'll send you a copy. Uh, but that package for, on the top page contains our information. Uh, uh, Tom Roach is a CPA. Um, because I give him so much business now, he's actually moved into my suite of offices now to handle all the paperwork. We have voluminous amount of paperwork to do in these cases. The trick is you don't steal the money and you do proper accountings of all the thing. The second matter is dealing with real estate. Those are most people's primary assets I deal with, and that's Gabrielle, uh, it, uh, who also moved into my office to be working out of my office because I have so much real estate I have to deal with and everything related to real estate also. Um, so the package that you have here is, first of all, the first page is our contact information. The second section is when you file for a guardianship. To figure out what a guardianship is, you can glance over those paperwork. So when you call those attorneys, you're going to have some idea what a guardianship is in Maryland and the requirements of a guardianship. Basically, assuming it's not a child, because then it's very simple, they're under the age of 18, you get a, a certificate from two docs or one doc and one social worker. The doc must have exam one of the docs must have examined within 21 days to say the person can't manage their affairs. Then guardianships thereafter come in two flavors. A guardianship of the person, and that, that's you come to the person's parent. What does a parent do? Makes decisions about m education, medical issues, and welfare issues. Frequently, that's the county adult protective services. By law, the county cannot be guardian of the property. So therefore, they go hire me, and they suggest me to the court. And the reason why they suggest me to the court is I handle these cases quickly and efficiently. I've been warned not to talk too fast by Bob because I get things done fast. If you ever want to get a job done, give it to a busy man, and I'm real busy. Uh, so I can blast through these cases pretty quickly, pretty efficiently, and um, for the benefit of the ward. Um, there are alternatives to doing a guardianship. The best way to avoid a guardianship is to pay me, the lawyer, it's great being a lawyer, first of all. First of all, we get paid a ton of money. And the second thing about being is we don't guarantee anything. It's great, you know. Uh, uh, you can pay me 100 bucks to write you a power of attorney, and then, or you can wait till you go crazy, and then you pay me $5,000 to file its petition for guardianship, and then the court picks another attorney to challenge me. And we two attorneys are all getting paid by you. It's great being a lawyer. And uh, these are the cases you can see. And these can turn into nasty custody cases. Think of the worst divorce case you ever heard of. They can turn into those things. Quarter million dollars is not unheard of. $50,000 is not unheard of. We like to have these things taken care of under $10,000. And that's because the person didn't pay 100 bucks to get a power of attorney. So if you don't get a power of attorney, you'll get one. Um, you can also 
uh, become just rep payee if the only issue is Social Security. You can go to Social Security, become a rep payee. You can set up joint accounts. Um, you can set up, uh, there's something called, as I'm sure you all know, called the surrogate decision maker law. A surrogate decision maker law is for medical purposes that if someone does not have an advanced directive, their closest relative can therefore can be recognized as a surrogate decision maker and make some decisions. So there's some reasons you may not need a guardianship, but let's assume you don't have any of those things and you hire me. Um, so when you represent the petitioner, and that's the person who files the petition to get the appointment going here. Uh, that's the package, that first section of papers you have there, about 20 pages, shows all the documents that need to be filed with the court to get this guardianship done. Let's talk about, I spoke briefly about gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are these decision makers out there. The first name you want to know is Fiona Graham. She's a Montgomery County Head of Adult Protective Services. She is the queen of Montgomery County. She's a county employee. She just wants to have her life made easier, like any good bureaucrat, okay? So if you want to provide services to Fiona Graham, uh, or offer your services to Fiona Graham, and say, by the way, recommend to Bob that you hire me, I'll hire you in a heartbeat, because I don't care. I want my life easier also. Uh, and also, if you screw up, it's on Fiona Graham's uh, um, uh, responsibility, not mine. There are a number of law firms that represent facilities. The classic case is someone goes into a hospital, because you get brought there by in the emergency room, she gets, she stabilizes from the crisis. She's ready for discharge to a nursing home, and uh, the hospital has to unload them to somewhere, and they got to have a safe discharge plan. So the hospital will usually go searching around for a place to put them. And again, as you know, in this area, there's a hundred different places to put them. Where they go, I don't care really, because as long as it's a safe, licensed, appropriate place, uh, then they'll. The hospital will pick a place to go, and they'll go into that facility, and they'll call, uh, get me appointed guardian for the purpose of signing them in as guardian of the property. Go look for their money, and Tom and I go for a money hunt, and that's what we do. We hunt found for money. We hunt the money up. We tell the facility how much money they're going to get, whether they're going to get paid on MA or private pay, and we go from there. Now, the law firms are Holloway and Sullivan out of Baltimore, and Alicia Chernick out of Ellicott City are the two attorneys that represents um, most of the nursing homes in the area around here. Susan Barry Bluefield, the law firm of Lurch Early, and Tim Alderman represent most of the hospitals around here. These are gatekeepers. These are people who file on behalf of the facility, and all they want is their life made easy, okay? That uh, they're going to be the ones who, who, and they recommend me to the court to get selected uh, in this case also. Um, so then we get uh, selected out there. The... Um, now, the other attorney, remember I told you that other attorney gets picked, uh, and that's to represent the uh, ward against me, and basically it's to protect the ward from me doing any crazy stuff. There is an attorney named Rio Roquevarg. Rio Roquevarg has a contract with the state of Maryland to represent mentally ill people, and because of that, the court frequently picks her to be that attorney for the people because if there's no money to pay him in the case, she can submit her bill to the, to the facility. Rhea Roquevarg is a, a three feet tall fireball, okay? She's one of those people you don't want to cross, okay? But you want her on your side because she will tell me a lot of times about what she wants to do, and it's easier to go along with Rhea than fighting Rhea. Also, she's pretty good at what she does also. These are people that you should be talking to to say, Rhea, we'd like to have an opportunity to present to you and to talk to you and see, but, and by the way, tell Bob to use our services, and I will do it. I'm very easy going about these things also. Similarly, if you lie to Rhea or screw with Rhea on things, she'll cut your throat, and she will not allow you in any cases also. This is just the reality. We gotta be very nice to people in this case, also as we proceed through. Um, the other two people who are frequently do it is an attorney named Bill Foote and Nina Helwig um, in the county. Uh, Bill Foote's a very conciliatory person. If there's a lot of flames in the family, we put Bill Foote in, he's oil on the waters, he calms everything down. Nina Helwig pretty much goes along very easily, you know, and for people who don't like Rhea, they use Nina uh, a lot of times also. Nina Helwig out of Rockville. Um, so then uh, we also have children I deal with sometimes, children under the age of 18, they become orphans, or one parent is hugely inappropriate uh, for them also. And I take over their money and I'm guardian of their property. The horrible, stupid, ignorant thing we do here is 
when that child turns age 18, I turn the money over to them. Who do we give money to? Uh, yeah, we gave money to the girl, and we gave her about, gave an 18-year-old girl uh, pretty, what's it? $380,000. Sat down, wrote her a check, and handed her a check. Is that the stupidest thing you can think of ever happening on the planet? I have tried. I had Gabriella and another young lady in my office kind of chat with her. She has another disability, and that is she's a very handsome young lady also. And I said in two years she's going to be penniless and pregnant. Uh, that's the reality. But trying to talk to people, can you see how the financial planners out there might want to talk to this young lady and try to get a referral to them also? These are the ones you talk to guardianship attorneys to say, by the way, I can offer your services to these minors by explaining to them how putting it into government bonds and laddering it out. So when your uncle comes out of the woodwork and they all want $10,000, you can say, I can't give you the $10,000. It's locked up. Call my financial planner. Okay? So there's services you can provide to those folks also. The other kid was Oscar. Uh, Oscar. And how much did you give him? $250. We gave it another kid, 18 years old. Um, his mom died in a house fire. The insurance company paid off on the case. He got to an attorney who spent an awful, awful lot of money on the estate, an awful, awful, awful lot of money on the estate before it got to me, and he only got $250,000. He should have gotten probably twice that much money also. Trying to explain to an 18-year-old why you know, he should take that $250,000 and invest it in government bonds rather than go to the Corvette dealership, and again, that money's going to be gone. And his uh, uncles all showed up at the time to pick up the check because they're all real happy and real friendly with him at the time. This orphan had nobody around him when I was handling the case, but they come out of the woodwork here. Uh, when I become emperor of the world, I'm going to raise the age of majority to about 35. Uh, <laughs> but I seriously, when I write wills for people and they leave money to their children, I say give them half the money at 25 and half the money at 35. Because they'll take the 25 money, they'll be stupid, and they'll lose it, and then they'll get smarter for the other half of the money also. But it doesn't happen in guardianship cases, okay? Then I go out. I'm the money guy. I control everything. The guy who controls the money makes 95% of the decisions because I control the money. I want my life easy. I have, a, I have when you're young, you're a child, you become an adult. Later in life, you become a child again, and some get stuck in petulant teenagerhood. I have a hundred petulant teenagers I'm responsible for, and they are driving me nuts. So I want all, everything else in my life easy. So when I hire services, I want them just fix the thing. Don't tell me why. Don't tell me how. Explain to me what's going on here. Um, I use, for social worker case management services, Seabury Case Management Services, because they've worked out pretty well for me. Who else in this audience provides case management services? Any of that? What, what, what organization are you with? Okay, so uh, these are other organizations that you can do. I use Seabury because they've worked all w well with me. I don't tend to stay with vendors permanently because they go bad on you. And one of the things that go bad on you is if there's a problem, you call them up and say, solve this problem for me. Well, you know, it's really not part of our job to solve it. Fine, you're done, you're done. You know, move on to the next one. Uh, the next one is I use Capital City Nurses for a lot of the uh, um, nursing care that's provided home health aids that get provided here. Who in the audience provides home health care services? What company are you with? Specialty care services out of Silver Spring. Okay. CNAs and, and you're, sir? Care plus home health. Okay, and? Right. Okay, and who else? Trustee. Trustee. Okay, and? Home instead senior care. Senior helpers. Okay, and who else in the back there? Senior helpers. Okay, there's a lot of you guys who do a lot of services. You got to be calling um, these gatekeepers and offer your services to them, because I don't want to use you all unless I can blame somebody else in case you screw up. Okay? I have moved on. This is about the third case management service I've used because you have people that go bad and you, uh, the it, uh, home health aid's not working out, and you call up and say fix it, and they say, well, we really only get these independent contractors and assign them to your caseload. I said, are you out of your mind? Fine, you're done. Move on to the next one, OK? I'm having discussions with Seabury and with Capital City Nurses over that exact problem right now. So we're going to be moving, moving on to somebody else here. I would like to find someone who someone else will take blame for you in case you do screw up, though, if I hire new services. It's called the cowardly practice of, whoa. All right. That's all right. 
This is it. We do this periodically to keep you all awake here and make sure it goes on here. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Just right on time. Just wait a little There you go. The, um, um, so we have, um, okay, so after appointment, the guardian of the person, and I'm a guardian of the person of some people. That's why I will pick the facility. Usually I get somebody else to do the picking, what goes on here. But I can pick the facilities, and there are facilities I deal with who I have a reputation of dealing with who have not screwed me up in the past here also. Um, the, um, I use banks. Uh, for stock brokerage, I use UBS and Bethesda. The reason why I use UBS and Bethesda is because Solomon Smith Barney and the other people, they both screwed me up. I control millions and millions of dollars. I don't care if the money doubles. I'm not trying to hit a home run. I don't want to lose the money, okay? So I want to buy government bonds. Stock brokers have a problem sometimes with seeing all these millions of dollars sitting there, and if they could just turn the account a little bit, they can make tons of money. And I say, you touch that money, I'm going to cut your throat, okay? They touch the money, and they start buying things. I thought you really, really wanted me to really do this also. Fine, thank you very much. Tomorrow they get the phone call, come through, and all the millions get moved out of there also because I cannot afford to screw up. How many financial planners do we have out there? Do we have anybody in the audience? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, what's your, who are you with? Merrill Lynch Wealth Management Special Needs Group. Okay. That's an example of some of the people that I would kind of hire right now also. <clears throat> Two accountants ago I had problems with Merrill Lynch also because a guy out in Rockville got cute with me one time also. You can't have that. You can't have that also. Who else in there? Okay, another one, and anybody else who is in that in the back pro? New York Life. New York Life also. Any more? Freak out, Larry Shulman May. Okay, it, who's that with? Larry Shulman May. Okay, anybody else I miss? Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Another Merrill Lynch. Okay, Merrill Lynch has always been kind of the gold standard also, okay? I don't hire companies, I hire people, okay? Because I want to call up Joe and say, Joe, first of all, nobody understands what the hell guardianships are. They say, that's like a power of attorney, isn't it? No, it's a guardianship. Well, that's kind of like an estate, isn't it? No, it's a guardianship. So the first time I go in, i got to spend an hour explaining to the person legally what I do, okay? And then I say, I'm never going to have this conversation again. Second of all, don't play with me, okay? I'm going to tell you to put, invest this money. I'll give you millions of dollars, but you're not going to make much money off it. It's going to be under government bonds. You'll get some charge for the money under management also. And you have to sell all the stupid investments they made previously and make commissions off that. Otherwise... Don't screw with me on this whole thing. And it's really hard sometimes when you see millions of dollars in this account and they have their monthly meetings and they say, why aren't you getting more money out of this account? Because Bob McCarthy said he'd shoot me if I touched it, okay? And that's kind of the problem you have here right now also because I have to protect these folks' money. I gotta be as conservative as possible. The law says guardians have to be stricter with their money than you are with your own money, okay? The other thing is we have to account for every penny. That's when Tom Roach comes in here right now because these people make these massively stupid investments all over the place. And if they are Depression-era people, they keep the share certificates in their own areas, which and it's all in a lockbox in the floor of their master bedroom closet. And when they get partial dementia, they also have their will in there also. So they come down with dementia, they go into the lockbox and pull it all out because, oh, yeah, I have three kids, and there's their names. Oh, yeah, I have the stock stuff, and they fall on the floor. Then, when we get inside the case three months later, Gabriella, who does the real estate work, and I go into the house, and we find under the pizza boxes and months old Washington Post, and I find all these share certificates stuck down there also. And we've got to try to dig these up also. And then we try to go through the process. And that's why when we use services like Merrill Lynch or one of these other financial services, I go to you and say, here's the person's date of birth and social security number. Here's what I found. Find all their stuff and bring it into here also. So I'm a great heavy user of services, but sometimes people don't like so much. They just like making the commissions off the stuff. Okay, so that's an example of the heavy services I need um, to start tracking the money down. Um, we then, um, banking. I now use Cap One primarily. Tom hates it because there's not a drive-in close by. But, Cap and they don't do online guardianship services. Works for me, makes his life miserable. But uh, Wycovia or Wells Fargo, has online banking services also, which are better also. What's the problem? I don't go to banks, I hire bankers. I wanna to go to Joe or Sally or Susie and say, I gotta to go to you and here's what a guardianship is. Is it like an estate? No. It's like a power of attorney? No, it's a guardianship. I explain it to them, send it to legal the first time, I never wanna have this conversation with you again. 
and I'm going to come in and do all these transactions, all these bizarre things, but you've got to understand what I'm doing here right now. Are any bankers in here right now? Okay, no bankers. Good. I can badmouth bankers then. Okay. Um, because, unfortunately, because of the realities of the finances, they're firing all their bank officers, they're firing all their tellers, they're hiring these kids with these eighth grade educations to go in there and call themselves bankers, and they really do pay them not much more than minimum wage, you know, twice minimum wage, if that, if that, pay them twice minimum wage. And these are the people I gotta try to explain this to. Can I talk to your legal department? No, you can't talk to our legal department also. You know, uh, only I can talk to them. I said, well, great, tell them this. I'm taking $2 million out of this bank tomorrow unless you solve this problem for me also, okay? And this is some of the problems you deal with. Bank of America is horrible to deal with because they're the worst. They shift everybody around the place. You gotta get a banker that you know that you can deal with. What bank I deal with? I don't care as long as they're just providing the services for me and handling the problems they have. So then the primary asset, very frequently, unless there's very, a lot of stocks and bonds, is the person's house. I work in Montgomery County. The average housing price there is $600,000, tons of houses. What I will do now is we'll find the house, we'll get the address, Gabriella and I will go into the house. Now, Gabriella is a realtor, but much more than that also. Um, Gabriella Al, and I will go into the house. We'll look at what's there. We'll dig through the pizza boxes and the Washington Post newspapers. We'll get the stock brokerage firm. We will put the religious items in one box and give it to some family member somewhere. Don't ever throw that stuff away. We'll get the legal papers and the financial papers in another box, and everything else gets hauled to the dump. I mean, 90% of what people have in their life gets thrown in the dump. And everybody here has been their whole life accumulating all your junk. When your parents die, you don't want their junk because you already got your own junk, okay? We take things down to Wessler's auction house. Tommy Wessler says Wessler's is financial undertakers. <laughs> Wessler's auction house will come in, they'll appraise everything. They'll count one, two, three chairs, one piano, one uh, amplifier, and they'll write it all down a long list also. And then they also, but they only list about 10% of the stuff in the house. Everything else gets hauled to the dump. When you all die, most of your stuff's going to the dump. That's the reality is. So don't get too attached to it. The stuff that's valuable, we haul down to Wesler's and we auction off. And then we, it's specialty items like uh, coins and jewelry get auctioned off. I had a, uh, a gilded ed edge Lutheran Bible written in German that I sent to the bookkeepers up in New York to, to auction off also. I came across a lady who was in 1938, a very famous actress in Berlin in 1938. And of course, what did I find in the back of the uniform? Nazi uniforms also. So we're going to dispose of the Nazi uniforms and Western says, no, it's a valuable asset. There's, there's a market beyond people who do that recreation stuff also, and they have a market for this stuff also. You got to sell what you got to sell here also. Um, what were we talking about before? We are talking about uh, guns. I am the biggest gun dealer in Montgomery County, Maryland, okay? <laughs> Every little old lady in town has a gun in the place also. <laughs> And they got more guns around here. That one lady, who, who was there? Lady, lady out in Gaithersburg. That little lady lived with her, her mom and her sister. And uh, she, she, had, she was stopped by Gaithersburg police walking around in her bathrobe, and they found the 38 in her pocket. And of course, you ask her why you had a 38. And it says, we're all three old ladies living together. Of course we have a gun, you know? And I said, all right. So we took the gun from her and moved her into Asbury Village. And you and I and the county social worker around visitor in Asbury Village. And I said to her, the lady has $2 million, uh, worked for the government all her life, no check, no child, just saved all the money. And she was in Asbury Village. I said, lady, you have $2 million. I want to make your life comfortable. What do you want? And she says, I want a gun. And, <laughs> and of course, the county social worker said, God bless the social workers. They're all these lovely, liberal, kind of sweet people also who are gun paranoids. They flip out. You can't have a gun. And she says, well, I don't want a big gun. I just want a little gun. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you want the gun for? Because we're at Asbury Village and people are coming in here and somebody comes into my room and I don't want to come in here, I'm going to shoot them. And I turned to her, and, and Tom, what was it? You're, Tom, you're sitting next to the social worker between her. And a little lady gave me a little wink because I knew she was screwing with, with the social worker for a while. And I said, no, darling, you really don't want a little gun. You know, you get a better spread pattern with a shotgun. And I'm like, maybe I'll give you a small shotgun. <laughs> she can't have a shotgun, she can't have a shotgun. Fine. We have had, um, I am on first name basis with the, um, in Montgomery County, they always have these little departments here, and they have a gun recovery department. There's no guns in Montgomery County. We don't have, we don't have a whole lot of crime in Montgomery County. So they get really excited when I call because I can help their statistics a lot with the FBI and saying I recovered all these guns. Well, I gave them to them. I walked in there. The funny story was in 
Tacoma Park. Went to that lady over there in Tacoma Park, and we found all those guns. And uh, they had previously searched the house for a gun because she threatened a neighbor with it years ago. We found them two days later buried. Well, Gabrielle, or one of her people, found them buried in the back of a closet somewhere. I brought them into the, <coughs> the fighting, the fine force of Tacoma Park police officers. The officer with his rainbow shades on and his nunchucks in his back pocket, I said, oh, this is going to go well. <laughs> so I have the guns in my car at Tacoma Park police station. I go inside and I say, by the way, I got 12 guns in there. Why didn't you bring him in? Oh, yeah, this is going to go real well. Be walking to the police station with a handful of guns also. I'd make it three feet inside the door. Bring the guns in. They pile it down, and they said, one of the officers said, what's a brand new gun? I said, I don't care. You want it? Go ahead. Merry Christmas. You know, you can have it. I don't care. I don't want it. I just don't want to have it around my ladies. There was also, it had a 22, and a 22 for you people who aren't gun people, a very small caliber bullet. A very small caliber bullet, but the gun was rusted, and the rusted shell casing had swelled a little bit. So what did he do? He took the gun, turned it like this, and said, I can get that bullet out of here. I said, would you mind not doing that till I leave here? Because if there's only two of us in the room and the police officer winds up getting shot in the face, he's not going to admit that he did that also. So I said, so we're really kind of careful about guns. We recover a lot of guns now and turn them in there. We had one guy who literally was a gun collector, and he had 400 guns in the, in the place also. He was mentally ill, kicked out of the house. I was assigned by the county to seize his house. The floor in the house in Aspen Hill was actually collapsing from the weight of the guns. He had so many guns piled up in there. Um, he showed back up. I said, shoo, shoo, go away. He won't go away. I said, I got to call the police then because I'm the guardian of the property. This is my house now. You can't have the house. You got to go. I called the Montgomery County Police, and what did I say? I'm here in the house. I got a whole bunch of guns in the house here. And the... Um, um, and the guy won't leave. He sent over a police officer. They sent over this 12-year-old. Okay, That's it. He, w he was adorable looking, just, looked just like a real police officer. He walked in here and came in and I explained the situation to him also. He said, well, I got to call for backup because the rule is you always call for backup with mentally ill people. I don't know what he said on the radio, but all of the police showed up at that time also. <laughs> I can just imagine this thing. I'm in a house with a house full of guns and the crazy guy here and what are you going to do also? Well, they, they came out of the woodwork also. And one of the older officers went to the guy and said, shoo, you know, just go away also. Now, I can't bring guns to Wessler's house. Why? Because Wessler's is located in D.C. Gun restrictions and stuff like that. So we went to Howard County and had a big auction and they had all the movie companies come in from California to bid on all these antique guns we had there. And of course, he was also a convicted felon because he passed a $500 bad check in Virginia and we found three modern guns and that's why he's now back in jail for, for doing that also. Um, jail. I do put people in jail. Every year I put people in jail. The maximum sentence I so far have got is for 40 years. Why is that? Because people financially exploit these old folks, okay? It's real hard to get, if you're gonna rob somebody, rob an old person. It's the best crime you can have. The dumbest crime you can do is hit somebody in the head with a rock on the street and take $12 out of the pocket. Rob old people because the average sentence you get, we had a tax preparer in Montgomery County. Now think about a tax preparer, a financial planner, you have access to your dates of birth, social security number, all your identification, all your finances. And they robbed this person, about half a million dollars. Went to Vegas. They usually, they blow it in Atlantic City or Vegas or drugs or other substance abuse problems. The money's always gone. The judge came in and gave that person 18 months in jail. Now, how many people would serve 18 months in jail for $500,000? I would suggest you most of the population out there would do that also. So it's not a dissuading at all. Um, but I tell people, you will go to prison. If you touch this money, I will put you in prison. The problem I had was the lady who got 40 years in jail, she was found in a motel room, um, nude. She's about 80 years old, covered in her own feces because she's been there for three days also. And the note from the guy said, bring all your jewelry to the, uh, to the motel because I can protect it for you also. What he had done was he was expecting her to die of exposure there in winter in an unheated motel room and then take the money. And uh, we had another person who was in Rockville Nursing Home, and uh, the son had exploited dad for $750,000. The wife was a nurse. Wife comes and brings him his homemade soup, and a guy gets violently ill, and, and he starts bleeding internally. Oh. So I have the soup tested, because I think he put rat poison in the soup. And they said, no, what she was using is she was using vegetables in the vegetable soup, their natural blood thinners, which caused them to bleed internally. And they're going to bleed him to death. And she was willing to murder this guy 
to cover up her husband's crime. And, and she says, no, 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 he is really disabled. Look, we took a videotape of him, and they had a videotape of this guy who was a really calm, quiet guy, ricocheting off the walls. She'd get him drugs and as an RN and give him a note. So she was trying to murder this person. So I told the state's attorney's office, she got another one for you, and they said, it's a perfect crime. It's a perfect crime. How, how can you say, I just gave daddy his favorite soup? He's too crazy to answer what it was. I just gave him his favorite vegetable soup, you know? So people get away with these crimes all the time. I'm only able to really catch about one out of 10. But when I do, I always write the sentencing memo to help the court to try to put the person in prison for a long, long time if I can. Um, so I have no sense of humor about this stuff if I find people are screwing around with them also, which is, again, we go by the services I hire. If you're providing me with a home health aid, that person better be honest, because if not, I will put them to prison. If you are a financial planner and you screw around within limits, <laughs> but if you go beyond those limits of screwing around, you're going to have problems here. And we had an attorney in D.C. Uh, forget all the attorney jokes. As a rule, I find attorneys to be really superior people, generally speaking, also. They're, they're some of the finest people I've ever <laughs> I, generally, I generally find them. And generally, if an attorney tells me something is true, it's true. Generally speaking, well, I had one guy who had this old lady write a will that's going to leave all of her money, and she's on death's door, leave all her money to raise to his children. And there's a law that says attorneys can't write wills where they financially benefit off. So we voided that will, and we found out he recontacted her again. No, we voided that will and got him to surrender his license in lieu of being disbarred in Maryland. And then he still has DC license. He had her sign a second will again. That time I reported him to attorney grievance. And that's the only attorney I've reported to attorney grievance right now because they're, they're robbing people also. So um, then we now go, oops. OK, so we deal with the houses. Um, Gabriella will go out and, and go through the house. And then the house is always packed with all this crap. We've got to pack it up. Uh, and we have the, they call themselves transition specialists. They go into the house, they sort things out, uh, and they do it much better and more efficiently. We have transition specialists here, right? That, you. Know. Um, sorry, who are you with? Uh, Graceful Transition. Graceful Transition. See, transition specialists also. And Helen? Helen Merritt, Eric, the basement of state cleanup. Right. Uh, Ellen and I worked on, uh, for a while, they're also cleaning out some of these houses also. And they give the first case, and we have to get, and she reminded me of having given her business recently. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, care for you, we work with Space Matters. Right. And then? Okay, and what do you do also in transition? Uh, transition. Okay, and these are the things you got to do through. You got to have people who could do the triage of the house. And again, like I told you, religious items go into one package, um, uh, uh, legal papers go into other papers, financial things of financial value go to a third pot, and everything else goes to the dump. Um, or normally, if they have a ton of money, we normally put it in a storage, even if it's crap, it's just bug infested. I don't care. I just put it into storage because you can always tell the people that their things are available. But when they run out of money, then you got to sell all the stuff to the dump eventually. But if you got enough money, you're trying to be sensitive to them a little bit. But it's, a, it's, it's pretty brutal. It's, in a way, it's violent what you're doing to these people's lives also. But you got to do it. you got to do it. you got to do it. I mean, uh, and, and if they had their own family or if they had a power of attorney and they had made their own plans, they wouldn't have to deal with this. So Bob McCarthy has to do it, and I'll do it my own little way to get it done. Um, so then, then we go through and inspect the house. We do an audit, a financial survey, find out what the house is worth. Is it worth doing repairs or sell it as is? If it's worth doing repairs and we have the money available, we fix it up, and then we flip it. And I sell a house, and I probably sell a house a month, two houses a month, something like that also. Um, and you just move the thing through. You move it through. You get it done. You know, and, it's, and it is worth what it's worth. I mean, it's very cold-hearted. I mean, we just do what we need to do about this stuff also. When we do the transitions with a house, the stuff in the house is worth what it's worth. I saw one guy. Went to the house, that house you dealt with in Rockville we just sold. They had that one room, it's filled floor to ceiling with model airplanes and little, uh, what do they call diorama things. They have the little tanks and little soldiers. And this guy has spent hundreds of hours in all these things, and there are hundreds of them in the room. And I talked to Tommy Wessler, what's it worth? He says, nothing, nothing. On the dump. Well, that's one I just couldn't bear. They had a few extra, I said, I gotta put this in storage. I just get, this guy reflected so much effort in this case. Then where we put the person, they normally transition from the hospital, hospital down to a facility. And of course, the best facility is the Methodist home, of course. There is no question about it. I have had people in this facility. This is a nice facility. 
I do like places that have, like the Asbury Village and stuff like that in the Methodist home also. There's just something about it. Um, Genesis and um, um, Manor Care are like the McDonald's and the Burger King. I mean, you're not going to go wrong there going to those places also because they've got their levels of care, but it's different from this place also. There are also a lot of the smaller houses. We have your facility. How many people uh, represent facilities here? Uh, okay, and who do you? Arden Courts. And we have we have our people at Arden Courts yes, County. And you're Angels just Garden. Assisted living. Yeah. And <clears throat> somebody was a client of yours recently living not personally, you know. You've got much better Tom. I see that also. <laughs> <laughs> you're back to wearing men's clothing and everything. It's really wonderful also <laughs> until no, he had a family member that that time took care of him. Who else is around here? And Okay. And we can move people out of state if their appropriate placements are made here right now. Uh, and any other place? Okay, let's talk about D.C. versus Maryland. Generally speaking, broadly speaking, Maryland facilities are cheaper than D.C. facilities. I don't know about Virginia. I mean, have Bob comment on that also. But generally speaking, that further in D.C., you have two other liabilities. You have a predatory bar association that's always suing these places also. And, then the, and the second thing is you have a court that's less, a system that's less sympathetic to getting these places paid. So in Montgomery County, the courts generally are very sympathetic to getting places paid. It's very important to me to get places paid because if I don't get the place paid, it's not going to be there for me tomorrow, okay? Having said that, it's reality. Bob talked about the reality. We're all reality-based in this room. It is what it is. If the person doesn't have any money, I have a situation right now where I've got this social worker in PG County driving me crazy. person makes $1,800 a month, moved him to a facility that pays that charges $3,000 a month, and they have uh, a $2,000 a month a pharmacy bill. And she's calling me and says, this doesn't work. I said, well, let me do this again. $3,000 for the facility, $2,000 for medicine, and they got $1,800. It'll never work. But if you just try harder, try what harder? It won't work, you know? And she, and I called the facility and said, well, she promised me there was money. I said, there is, $1,800. And the pharmacy said, but they promised me there was money. I said, there is, $1,800. That's it. So therefore, we go into the MA process, which you all are very familiar with, which Bob told me not to talk about. Anyways, <laughs> we're talking about the private pay cases we have. You know, we have a lot of people. I control millions of dollars. I can make decisions as to where people go, and it's usually only if there's a problem. If I go over to them and I say I need a report on something, well, I can't get it to you, and I'm not sure when I can. Perfect. No problem. Call up the county social worker saying we got to move them. Usually, I'm a really nice guy. I get along with everybody. Crazy people like me. It's one of my skill sets. Crazy people like me. Um, but in the in the facilities, if the, if you don't if you piss off the county social worker, they'll move you, and I'll go along with it in a heartbeat. And I don't care if you're my best friend. If they want you to move, I'll move them because I don't want to hassle from these people because these people are the gatekeepers that give me the business to start with. Also, so um, then we have a. Um, we have the younger folks that are mentally ill. They're very entertaining. They're very entertaining. Bipolar people. If a bipolar person takes his medication, they're saner than I am. If they don't take their medication, they'll walk into a room and be talking to several people and there's nobody there but them. And they'll be losing the argument, by the way, with the person in there also. Uh, and they come into my office that way sometime and we now keep our office door locked <laughs> during the days whenever we know certain people like Russell are out of jail again. Russell, bless his heart, was living in a 20-story building until he decided to throw a chair out the 20-story apartment window, crashed to the floor, and the, he, through. oh, through, I'm sorry, he threw it through the window and took the whole window frame and everything out with it. Um, he was not allowed to stay there anymore, and he found a new apartment house, and it's on the 18th floor, and they said the first place gave us a great recommendation. He said he could move today if he wanted to. We're willing to help him move today. The flower pot went out the 18-story window, crashed into a common area before, so he couldn't stay there anymore. So then he goes on the street, and goes off his medication, and he gets arrested for being stupid in public, you know, you know, whatever the thing, reckless endangerment, whatever it is, being stupid in public. And he goes to jail for a while. He stabilizes in jail. And jail is great for mentally ill people because if you can get your medication stabilized, you're okay. And then what do the jails do? Kick them out the front door. Uh, Shepard Pratt, I deal with people who go to Shepard Pratt, and they get stabilized on their medication. And I said, what do you do when they're finished and they're stabilized? They say, we move them to a homeless shelter. I said, really? Really? You don't think you can move them to some place where they're like supervised a little bit? No, we just send them out to a homeless shelter and that's it. Give them bus fare to a homeless shelter. 
So Russell periodically throws and gets up and down. He can't go to his mom's house because he threw a brick through her window. Russell has one way of communicating with people, and that usually involves projectiles. We had another lady also, and she was in one of the facilities out in Aspen Hill. And, um, and in the facility in Aspen Hill, bless her heart, she's 85 years old, and she was pretty nifty looking, she thought. And she was chasing around all the bus boys in the facility, too much they had to put like, a leash on her a little bit also <laughs> to tell her to calm down here. Um, but she had a, she came in one day and she had to show up in court for a hearing. She had flaming red hair, and this is an 85 year old lady also too. And she was just the bee's knee, and she would call me and raise hell with me periodically because she wanted to go out on dates and things like that. Now she's hugely demented and didn't know what planet she was other than she was really hot. You know, we had another client of mine who um, um, was. Everybody threatens me. I get threatened all the time. Uh, he threatened me all the time, and then he went out, and uh, and uh, I got a call from the state attorney's office saying, you know, uh, in, in last November he was threatening me about something or another. And also, I said, shh, go away, go away, go away. Uh, he was one uh, crazy person I couldn't deal with. Um, he got arrested for my, filing a petition to get a handgun last November. Uh, he went to eight different part, uh, gun shops to do it, and they kept on ringing him up, and he couldn't get it. Also, so he was charged with filing a false application to get a handgun because somebody was bothering him. That was me. Uh, so we had a chat with him. Our chat with him was, uh, was you know, nice guy. You know, otherwise, other than trying to kill me, he's a nice guy. And I said to him, uh, here's the rule. I got an office full of folks here. And I'm an old male chauvinist sexist. I have some young ladies working here in the, in the office. And you scare them. So, and you tried to get a gun to shoot me. Okay, so our rule is, is I'll meet you in the parking lot. Just call me on the cell phone, I'll meet you in the parking lot. And if I get to give you anything, that's fine. But if you come in the door, and his mom and his dad and his social worker, and remember the social workers are lovely about these things. If you come into my office, I'm gonna shoot you, okay? Now, I'm not speaking figuratively or metaphorically here also, don't come to my office. So, and Bob said, well, there's one thing I wanted to spend money on is I need $10,000 for an emergency. I wanna run for the House of Delegates. I said, perfect, you'll fit in there great. <laughs> He didn't get the $10,000. Um, we then deal with some of these houses are hoarder houses. The hoarder houses, as you walk in, it takes a half an hour. That one house that in wherever it was, that in Burtonsville, took a half an hour to get the front door open. And the things are canyons, and, you walk the, and you're walking that far off the ground because you're walking on stuff. And you're walking in these little canyons throughout what you need to do also, and trying to haul that stuff out and taking tons and tons and tons and tons out of, the, out of that house also. And it's all worthless. It's all going to the dump. You know, QVC is a horrible people. Um, the other issue is the financial exploitation. About a third of the case I'm involved in, there is financial exploitation. And the usual financial exploiter is a family member also. And again, I only put a couple of people a year in jail, which is really a bad batting average. You know, I got to try to put more people in prison if I can, but it's hard to do so. Uh, reverse mortgages. Okay, here's a reason to come to these meetings here. Here's a reason I come to this meeting. I hate reverse mortgages because all my financial explorers always use the reverse mortgages and the fees are really high also. Your discussion, your talk last month has convinced me there is appropriate place for reverse mortgages in financial planning in certain circumstances also. So again, I've done this for 30 years and I've now learned something new coming in the last month here all to this thing. So there are places for appropriate financial planning in this case, including reverse mortgages, including but you gotta be really, really careful what you're doing and who you're dealing with and look at costs and look at fees and make sure, and that's where Tom comes in. We run a lot of pro formas on this stuff. Um, taxes. One thing, excuse me, with the reverse mortgages is just what you said, the planning aspect. By the time we get involved, it's already set up, the money's going in somebody's pocket and all we're stuck with is a property that's well, on the Tom, why don't you stand up for a second also. We also have a, a also deal with uh, some of the tax issues we're involved in because you got capital gains for a lot of these folks. Obviously, if they got medical bills uh, and, and staying in a nursing home, they're not going to be. But this facility here, yes. uh, what, what percentage do you give for medical bills for people staying here in assisted living? Is it 30%? Yeah. For, for what percentage is considered a medical deduction? For 100%. We do. Well, I mean, some of the facilities will put out uh, year to year with the, the final bill of the year, give you a percentage and say uh, of your stay in the facility, and that's mostly on the ones that are elective for in there. If you're in for a medical reason, it's 100% deductible normally. 
but we run into tax problems with when he finds all these stock certificates. You have to figure out what the people paid for it, what their basis is, and if they don't have medical. So a number of times where they are, if they're able to stay in their place or they're with a family member or so, by selling all these things with low basis and picking up capital gains, you're giving them a huge tax burden, which then we try to mitigate that by selling it and again, you don't know what their life expectancy is, but if we'll sell them staggered throughout the, you know, uh, so this year, some next year, try to get the medical deduction to offset any tax. Uh, Which is one of the reasons why you need financial planners in this, by the way. we got to find out basis for this stuff. All these stock certificates are on the pizza boxes. We have to find out what the basis of that stock is, and usually we don't. But we can get some idea of kind of when they came to the area, and can you give a stock price at that time, because it's kind of defendable at that time also. Now, again... If you deal with a guy who's a broker by a broker by himself, he hates that because there's a whole lot of work he has to do also. And these are just problems I have with financial planners sometimes. I always got to have a, there's always, again, my sexist statement of the day, there's always a Marie out there. There's always some secretary or somebody out there who works their butts off who does all this stuff for you and gets it. And those are the people who really uh, produce for you because, again, I hire people, not companies here to well, work on it. plenty of cases you just... You're making an estimate and a guess because, as you all that work in financial, you know there's no way to pinpoint it exactly. You've got roughly for a time frame, but depends on when the certificate was issued as opposed to when they actually purchased it. So, uh, but just back to with the, the financial planning and the reverse mortgage, uh, the reason that you, you don't like them is every time it's come, somebody's used it to steal the person's money. Can so, I ask a case, a case sure. We're back to the judges. What do the judges want to do? And the prosecutors follow what the judges want to do. And they're really reluctant because there's always a power of attorney involved in the whole case also. And well, there's well, a well, no, in the case, if she's got full capacity. Right. Um, and he's been plundering her estate. Well, and that's really difficult also because let's – here's another <laughs> rule that comes up all the time. Is people are – we have a constitutional right in this country to be stupid, okay? That explains golf. I mean, really. I mean <laughs> – Guys dressing up like pimps to go chase a little white ball and not get the water cups all over the place also. Nothing is more absurd than that also, okay? But people have a right to be stupid as long as you're doing it with your own money, you know? I bought, to my wife's chagrin with my middle-aged crazy, bought a motorcycle a year ago also, being 56 years old. But I'm reasonably competent, so I'm allowed to be stupid that way. There's anything more ignorant than a 56-year-old guy buying a motorcycle also. But... I'm, you're allowed to do that stuff, and that's kind of the problem we have. And then the power of attorney thing comes in here. Somebody gives somebody a power of attorney, and they're doing some kind of foolish things also. Uh, a power of attorney, as a general rule, fiduciaries cannot make gifts, particularly to themselves. They haven't signed a power of attorney that says, and by the way, my fiduciary can make gifts to themselves, and they make gifts to themselves, which is stealing. Okay? How are you going to prosecute that? Was the person competent at the time? Probably, you know, and that's and that's the, the problem we have a lot of times also so with these cases. And then there's accountings we have to do. The other thing is when we're using services from all you all, we need a ton of paperwork from you because we need to give a ton of paperwork to Tom because Tom produces these phone books for the court of accounting for every possible thing we do. And it has to be accurate to the penny. And that's what we had work on. In that packet, you'll see the second set of papers there or the basic financial accounting forms you file. In addition, if you're a guardian of the person, and I am in two or three cases, you have to file a report of what the person's doing personally also. And then um, let's talk about the houses again. Uh, Gabrielle, I'm just going up here also. Um, again, working with Gabrielle, who's now working out of my office simply because we've got so much business going on with her right now, um, we go to a house, and the house is, load, uh, house is loaded up with crap, and we've got to get the, the, the matter resolved. If you'll see on the last page is the listing agreement we have developed of working with Gabriella, and you'll see there's an addendum to it. First addendum is it's not Bob is not personally financially responsible. I'm just a fiduciary. You can't take my house, okay? You can go after the ward all you want to also. And the other things we have is what other parts? 
we make it very um, knowledgeable from the very beginning that it's subject to court approval. Right, uh, so. because we have had deals before, although I have authority to settle, somebody comes out of the woodwork later on and wants to challenge it, I don't care, I work for the judge. And if the judge wants to overrule me, that's fine also. But and a lot of the times we sell them as is. Yeah. Well, it depends on the condition of the house. That's right. the, the financial analysis we do. Right. And, and usually we're right about that. But um, as you know, mow the lawn, you save yourself $10,000 on a house. I mean, you say I'll have $10,000 less if you don't mow the lawn. The, the shutters, the other thing, and it depends on what we have here based on what we, what we have. And do we have cash to do? Also, uh, part of Gabrielle's repair work is she has to find people who will wait for their money. Anybody who does these cleanup services, sometimes I say, I got no cash now, but when we sell the house, we'll pay you, you get paid off the settlement sheet. A lot of people won't do that or will agree to it and then change their mind halfway through, saying I didn't realize I had to wait three months. And you say, okay, well, remember that other paragraph that said Bob's not personally financially responsible? And, and well, I really need the money. Fine, I'll write you, Bob McCarthy will write a check personally and don't ever call me again, okay? Again, you can't, <laughs> I'm just too busy. I got too much crap going on here right now. And so what are the other things that we've been dealing with? You know, we deal with crazy relatives who want to steal things out of the house. Just being really, really sec securing the property as soon as we go that's, in. Okay. That's Changing the we locks right off the... We go in there and uh, Gabriella arranged to have locks changed. I got this big old nasty sticker I put on houses saying that uh, you know, this is under the court's authority by the court officer, Bob McCarthy. The other thing is when I go in these houses, remember the gun issue? We were very careful when we opened the door the first time. I spent a lot of times beating on the front door. I have this long cane and the thing. I beat on the front door for a while saying, I'm coming in. Court officer coming in here. Don't shoot me, please. Um, we also have a hazmat kit because sometimes there's various waste in the house you'll find sometimes. And sometimes it's human waste. And sometimes there's voluminous amounts of human. I have the weirdest law practice, I swear to God. <laughs> uh, so. And Gabriella has been, I use Gabriella because she does it all. She does from the locks to the cleaning the house to, to, to the repair work to hiring the contractor to overseeing the contract to doing everything also in that house. Also, plus she knows how the contracts work also. And then sometimes she doesn't get paid. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the guardianship gets terminated, they die first of all. The last thing is death, okay? And uh, we have our case with, <laughs> we had a young intern working in our office. He went to deliver some papers and pick up some death certificates. The funeral home said to him, but we have Uncle John in a coffee can here. How about if I give them to you? And the dummy took it and then drove away from the funeral home. Then he called me and said, I got Aunt Martha in a coffee can strapped in with a seatbelt on, by the way, in a two-pound coffee can. Turn around and drive the coffee can back to the nursing home. I had bumped for your funeral home one time, say, you know, we see that you paid for a funeral. We see you paid for, a, for an internment. We can't find the internment papers, by the way. Um, so we're going to deliver the remains to your office. I said, no, you're not. And, well, we're not going to keep them here. You're the person. We're going to give them to you. I said, I will pay out of my own pocket whatever it costs to enter them. And again, I never use Pump Free Journal Home anymore. Okay. Then he called me back up. I said, oh, it's a silly misunderstanding. We found the paperwork later. No, 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 no. We're funny with coffee cans here. Are you telling me I'm running out of time now? Yeah, you're done. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Today's sponsor is Nelson Leroy, who now has a new organization called Push Button Emergency Help. Nelson, where are you? Thank you, Robert. Uh, and thanks, Sandy, Jennifer, for a great breakfast. We enjoyed it as always. Um, you know, we just finished uh, finished up National Fall Prevention Month, and I was sitting in a forum with about 15 professionals uh, during the month, and I thought, well, what a lofty goal, right? We're going to prevent all falls. Uh, it occurred to me that that's not, not reasonable to expect, but to try to help folks learn how to take care of themselves, identify them, uh, problems, and keep from falling whenever possible. Unfortunately for them, fortunately for my business, falls are going to occur. Uh, I provide emer personal emergency response systems, have been since uh, 2002, and uh, during the course of this forum I was in, towards the end, someone asked the moderator, who is a home physician well known in the county, in Montgomery County, uh, well, who are you going to call first when, when mom is falling? And she turns around and points at me and says, him. I said, well, that's very kind of you. And everybody else you know, said, no, 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 call me first. Call me first, right? Because 
they all are part of this continuum of care that we have that finds a person who's having a problem, tries to recognize the symptoms, and then has to try and diagnose them, right? Things that we all do in one form or another in our professional lives, whether you're a care manager, a social worker, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a transitional, what, what did you call them? Trans transitional specialist. Transitional specialist, like Donna, uh, or a, uh, uh, a pick em up guy like me. And uh, my, over 10 years, 11 years, you know, I've always been like at the end of this continuum of care. After all the time going through the diagnoses, going through the testing, getting mom back and forth to doctor's appointments, clinics, testing, right? Then they finally say, oh, well, maybe she should have one of those little buttons in case she falls again. Well, duh, it's been three months, and she's been falling for the last three months. Only she's stopped telling you, or tried to stop telling you, because she's tired of me yelling at her. And of course, we always say mom fell because dad will never tell you, unless, you know, he happens to be at the bottom of the stairs with his head splayed wide open. Uh, so my uh, plea to you is to help mom not fall, help her get help when she needs help. It's much better while all the testing and diagnosing is going on that when she has that second fall, instead of being on the floor for four hours or overnight or three days because you had to go on that business trip and there was just no way out of it, right? She'll have something that'll get her up and the help she needs. Uh, because as we all know, that golden hour turns into two hours, turns into three hours. You know, not every fall causes a major injury. It's sometimes the getting up that causes it. It's sometimes the being on the floor for three days and having wounds that you've created by crawling across the floor that now become septic. And instead of just a few bruises, you've got a major infection to fight in uh, the hospital. So anyway, my new company is called Push Button Emergency Health, and we save lives with our service in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, just like Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for listening to me. Uh, and being as election day is tomorrow, I'm going to urge you to refer early and refer frequently. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>